Good evening, everyone. I'm Sean Maurer. I'm this year's coordinator of the Creative Writing Program, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our final event in the 2021-22 Working Writer Series, the Vocation of the Writer Talk with Rigoberto Gonzalez. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. So on behalf of Creative Writing, I want to thank Tom Landy, the center's director, for his generous sponsorship of our vocation talk. And since it's our last event, it's also time, the time for me to thank those creative writing colleagues whose hard work has made this year's Working Writers series so exciting and so meaningful for our students and the Holy Cross community. Shu Si, our Jenks Chair of Contemporary American Letters, Leah Cohen, our Barrett Chair of Creative Writing, Professor Leela Phillip, Professor Oliver de la Paz, and our wonderful visiting writer colleagues, Morris Collins and Hugh Martin. So I'm not going to ask them to stand up, and some of them are on Zoom, but could we just have a round of applause for our creative writing faculty? Thank you so much. And last but definitely not least, I want to thank the person without whose work none of this would be possible. That's Elise Saad, our terrific administrative associate who handles all of the logistical details with such grace and efficiency. So she's not here tonight, but we could not do it without her. So thanks to everybody. Yes, Elise. All right. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Professor de la Paz, who will introduce our speaker. Good evening, everybody. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Rigoberto Gonzalez. Rigoberto Gonzalez is the author of 18 books of poetry and prose, most recently the memoir Abuela in Shadow, Abuela in Light, from the Living Out Gay and Lesbian Autobiography series out of the University of Wisconsin Press. Rigoberto Gonzalez has also edited edited Camino del Sol, 15 years of Latina and Latino writing. His awards include grants from the Landon Foundation, Guggenheim, NEA, NIFA, and the USA Roland Fellowships, the American Book Award, the Lambda Literary Award, the Shelley Memorial Prize from, poet, from the Poetry Society of America, the Lenore Marshall Prize from the Academy of American Poets, and the Penn Veckler Award for Poetry. Gonzalez is a distinguished professor of English and director of the MFA program in creative writing at Rutgers University in Newark. He also teaches in the low res MFA program at Randolph College. His creative work has been widely recognized and lauded. His third collection of poems, Black Blossoms, received a starred review from Publishers Weekly who wrote, Gonzalez's poems depict the body as a space that carries burden and loss, the sight of a fleeting life, where lust and marriage, birth and death weave together in their observations and confessions. Booklist noted that his widely read memoir, Butterfly Boy, was wrenching, angry, passionate, ironic, and always eloquent about conflicts of family, class, and sexuality. The son and grandson of farm workers constantly moving between Mexico and the US then and now. Gonzalez weaves together three narrative threads, his angry present journey across the border with his estranged father, childhood memories of growing up a fat and bookish sissy boy, and his urgent longing for his sexy, abusive older lover, an unforgettable story of leaving home today. What is also of particular importance is Gonzalez's work as a historian and critic. His book of essays, Pivotal Voices, Era of Transition Toward a 21st Century Poetics, explores Gonzalez's literary family tree, where he contextualizes the work of contemporary queer writers of color like Natalie Diaz, Ocean Vong, and Eduardo Corral, while also paying deep homage to his predecessors like Juan Felipe Herrer, Francisco X. Alarcón. Additionally, his longstanding work with the El Paso Times as a monthly book columnist or his contributing editor work for poets and writers places other writers at the center. 
his work as an LA Times critic at large or his position on the editorial advisory board of the Machete series for Ohio State University Press showcases that he looks towards authors whose writing has historically been marginalized, ignored, and passed over. He has also served as a board member for many significant literary arts organizations like the National Book Critics Circle, the Poetry Society of America, Zoe Glossia, a community for poets with disabilities, and as, and as a board of trustees member for the Association of Writers and Writing Programs where I had a chance to see his work and his advocacy. He has a lot of bona fides and I can't cover them all. But what I can state plainly and clearly is that Rigoberto Gonzalez's career has always centered community. From his deeply personal, vulnerable creative work to his urgent and important advocacy work on behalf of writers who would otherwise not be heard. He epitomizes what it means to be an artist citizen in every way, whether it be serving as an influential writer of beautiful and heartbreaking works or his championing of up-and-coming writers. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Rigoberto Gonzalez. Buenas tardes, buenas noches. <laughs> buenas noches, buenas noches, gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for um, hosting me this evening, uh, for being here, uh, sharing your space and sharing this moment. Um, this is quite a challenge for me to, to talk about myself because I, I, I think I spend so much time talking about other writers, what other writers are trying to do in their works what other writers are trying to, um, how they're contextualizing the world. Um, I look at them as a critic, I look at them as a reader, I look at them as a, as a teacher. Uh, so talking about myself is, is a little hard even though I've written memoir, and I'll, and I'll um, get into that in, in a minute. But one of the questions that I always get is how I could be so prolific, how I could write so many books, how I could do so many projects at once. And so I think that the, the answer to that is actually in this photograph. This is um, 1973 uh, in, the, in the Delano uh, grape boycotts. Uh, I come from three generations of migrant farm workers. Um, something to know about, about these folks is that uh, nobody in my family knew how to read or write. Uh, and I didn't discover this until many years later because there was shame involved in not knowing that. Uh, there was also uh, a, a sense of um, uh, worthlessness when, when somebody is illiterate. Uh, and so one of the questions you might ask, is, that's my grandfather in the hat. Uh, and my grandfather always carried that clipboard. And when I realized that he didn't know how to read or write, I asked my grandmother, well, what was in that clipboard? And he says, oh, I'll show you what was in the clipboard. And the clipboard was blank. He just, it was just a, a kind of prop that he would carry because he was, the, he was an organizer. My grandmother is in the purple. And uh, one thing you don't know about her, I'm gonna come back to her at the end of the presentation, is a significant character, a significant figure in my life, is that she always liked to match, this is where I get my fashion sense, she always liked to match her, her bandana with, her, with her, uh, her outfit, even when she was picking grapes. You know, and I remember uh, one time uh, coming across all these bandanas of many different colors is because she always matched them. She always liked to match. That was her. Uh, my uncle is the uh, young, a young man there in the, in, the, in the front, and that's me in the back, and I'm three years old at that time. Uh, organizing was important in my family uh, because they were illiterate, because many of them were also undocumented. And so during the great boycotts, uh, your choice was to join this, this fight or risk not having even what little rights you had as an undocumented migrant farm worker. Uh, during this time, I, I, you know, I don't have many memories of, of this period, but I did work in the graves of my family for many years. In fact, the last time that I worked in the graves was in 1993. I was 23 years old and I was actually in graduate school at UC Davis. 
And uh, that's me, and my father took that photograph of me. Uh, I came back to uh, spend some time with my family in the summer. I knew it was gonna be the last time I would be with my family because everybody was gonna move back to Mexico. They had enough of, the, of this country. They were all gonna move back. And that was the last summer they're gonna spend in the US. And I wanna spend the summer with them. Uh, but they said, but we're gonna work. You know, so if you wanna spend time with us, you're gonna have to work along with us. So I was 23 years old in graduate school, and there I am carrying the grapes. I don't know how many of you have ever done any kind of labor, uh, such labor. I don't know, anybody? Right, I mean, it, it's, uh, to be out in the sun, it makes you appreciate so much of your privileges that you have to not be in the sun. It also makes you appreciate the, the energy, the strength, the life that many of these workers give so that we can afford to buy these grapes or buy the onions or buy the, the strawberries because it's the cheap labor that keeps the prices down. If uh, farm, farm workers were paid what they really should be paid, uh, I think many of us cannot afford those fruits or vegetables. Right? Uh, so during this time, I, I, I knew that um, a couple, I learned a couple of things. One, the community was important, that a fight was not only about yourself, but it was about uh, those around you. My mother was uh, also an organizer, uh, and she actually risked getting, she was undocumented, so she risked getting deported. And that was an important decision that she made. And I remember many years later finding out that she had told my aunts, if I get deported, you know, you gotta take care of my children. But it's important that I be out there fighting for, for the rights of farm workers. Right? Uh, I took this same energy into my education. I think every single place that I inhabited, uh, there was something that, and it wasn't really that conscious. I, I didn't set out to do this. In, uh, as an undergraduate, I was the founder of, uh, of a dance company that's still in at UC Riverside. We founded it in 1988, and it's still there. It's still functioning. We also founded a teacher's organization. When I was in a graduate school at Arizona, at Arizona State, uh, I helped fund a funding source for the Hispanic Student Association. Same thing when I was in UCLA, New Mexico. And for me, it was like, it was, it was, I didn't even think about it. I said, you know what, I have to participate because that's what you do. That's something that you do. I saw my family risk their well-being, their, um, uh, their ability to stay in this country. What am I risking, really? When I, when, if, some, if something like this should fail, it's, it's, it's really low risk when you think about it, right? Uh, so from them, I took the courage to do something bigger than me. It wasn't just about going to an institution, getting an education, taking everything that I could. It was like, okay, what is it that you're gonna give back? Right? Because that's what I saw my family do uh, so many generations. I still keep this photograph, by the way, at my every writing desk I've ever had. I've always had this photograph as a reminder, not only of the work that I did, but my father who took that photograph. So 1999, so often a pitcher goes to water until it breaks my first book. This was my uh, love letter to, to Mexico, to the border, to the stories that I grew up hearing, to the stories that I imagined of people that, uh, like my family, had to leave home, the sacrifices that it takes to reimagine yourself in a different country. The story of my birth is the following. Uh, my mother says, uh, told me that um, she was pregnant uh, with me. Uh, and uh, she and my father decided to cross the border because she said, she was 19 years old, and she said, you know, we have nothing to give this child, absolutely nothing. We have no property, we have no money, we have nothing. The only thing we can give this child is citizenship. So they crossed the border. Uh, these were different times, you know, 19, this is like 1969, 1970. Uh, when, uh, when they reached a fork in the road, my father said, well, which way should we go? Should we go left, should we go right? And my mother said, let's just go left. And that's how they ended up in Bakersfield, California, where I was born. And then two years later, my brother was born. So the picture goes to water until it breaks is a testament to the, to the uh, uh, labor that um, many people undertake in this country, invisible labor, invisible lives, though, they're, though they, what they do is very significant. Uh, they're invisible, uh, they're rendered voiceless, so they have voices. They are rendered um, worthless, so they have value. 
so it's just my way to, to celebrate, to honor, to pay tribute to people who led lives like my family did, the anonymous farm workers. So in 2002, 2012, came another stage of my thinking about community, and that's becoming a, a book critic and a book reviewer. One thing that I realized when my book came out, uh, there, there was no, there was not that much critical attention paid to the book. A couple of reviews here and there, but I didn't expect any because I realized that so many people that came before me also did not have uh, all these critics lining up to review the books, to give attention to, the, to, their, uh, to their creative work. And so I said, well, you know, the solution that my family always taught me, if, you know, if, if there's a need, then do it, right? So I basically taught myself how to review a book. And so from 2002, 2012, I was given the opportunity to review uh, books and I reviewed, I did 226 reviews of Latino literature. Some of these books that I reviewed, I was their only review. Uh, and, and this, you know, and I knew this going in that I, I would, be very active looking for these books of people who deserve to be seen. They deserve to be noticed. Because think about it. I always, that's why I tell my students when, when I'm teaching a workshop and their work is out, you know, the most disrespectful response to art is silence. When nobody talks about it, when nobody says anything. Right? And so I said, so, so somebody labored over this chapbook, this novel, this book of stories, this book of poems, and then nobody said anything. Sometimes these, these presses are, are so small that their distribution was very limited, that so many of these authors had to sell their books to their you know, backpacks, to their friends, to their families. So I thought, well, you know, here's a, here's a platform that I've been given. Let me do as much as I can, review as many books as I can. And this, was, uh, this helped me understand also the landscape that I was operating in because the other thing that I wanted to establish was, you know, where is my lineage? Who are my contemporaries? Right? This is important to know who, who is there sitting, writing beside me, imagining beside me. Right? In 2003, also you're going to see a, a, a shift. You know, this is 2003, and, and I know these book covers are probably the ugliest book covers, but back then I thought they were pretty cool. <laughs> so in 2003, I published uh, two books. One was a uh, Crossing Vines, which was very much inspired by my work in the fields. It, it's about a community of my migrant farm workers. They're picking grapes, they're grape pickers. And so sort of that size size is a book about a, uh, a young Puerto Rican girl, because I was at the time I was living in, in New York City and I was working in an after school program with Puerto Rican uh, children. And so uh, one of the things that, that I understood uh, about their lives was the, the notion of being a, a latchkey kid, which I was when I was young. So it's about a little girl who has to use her imagination to try to, want, to, try to uh, keep herself motivated, keep herself um, and entertained because she comes home to an empty house. And that's what sort of that size, size is all about. Uh, it's one of the, the uh, two children's books that I, that I published. And, um, the other thing about, about being a writer is that I never really, I never limited myself to one genre. Uh, when I, when, when uh, I don't know how many of you have taken classes, but you know that you have to sort of choose, you have to choose a, a path. Uh, and that's even truer when you are, when you go into a graduate school, they tell you, well, you're gonna be a poet or you're gonna be a fiction writer. And so my understanding of a writer was somebody that just wrote. Right. So I actually went to two writing programs. I did a writing program in poetry at UC Davis and a writing program in fiction at Arizona State. Because I thought, well, this is the only way I can do it, I'll, that's the way I'll do it. But I never lived in myself. I started writing nonfiction during a time when nonfiction uh, was very new. There were no, no classes being taught in, in nonfiction and memoir writing, and I just dove in. And then children's books, same thing. Again, there was a need, I thought, well, you know, I, I, I was using books, uh, children's books, in my after school program, and there was not a single one had Puerto Rican characters. So I said, well, I'll, I'll just write one myself for, my, for the young people that I, that I look after. And this is my, uh, my second children's book. I have two books, of all my books, I have two best-selling books, and these are the books I sell year after year. My bread and butter, I still get royalty checks from these. And one of them is this one. 
And this is Antonio's card, La Tarjeta de Antonio, and because it's about a little boy with two mothers. And so this was a, a, a book that, uh, you know, the one thing that you want as a writer is for one of your books to be banned. Because then everybody wants it. Everybody wants to read it. Everybody's curious about it. And so when the book was banned uh, in, in 2005, uh, we received a, a grant from this uh, family to uh, the, the, the illustrator, Cecil Alvarez and I, to go across the country and present the book to different libraries and different communities. Um, I was terrified because I thought, you know, a banned book in a library, is it gonna be difficult? And also I thought, what kind of questions are children gonna, gonna ask? And I'm, I don't know if I'm comfortable. So I was terrified about this. And I remember the, the first time, you know, I, the, the, the uh, illustrator and I are reading this, this book, and then at the end, we, uh, we said, are there any questions? And all, every, every hand shot up, all these children. And I go, oh my gosh, let me see, hopefully nothing crazy. And I said, sure, you know, how about you? And all the questions never went above, like, is that you? <laughs> Did you draw that? Is that your mom? You know, that was it. It was nothing complicated. Nobody asked about the two mothers, you know, in the, in the book. So that was refreshing. Um, around this time, I had the opportunity to, to uh, uh, join the Poets and Writers magazine, which is the industry magazine. Uh, and again, every opportunity that comes to me, like any opportunity, you have a choice. You can say no, you know, I don't have time, I'm too busy. Uh, and one thing that I realized about many writers, many writers, is that they're very protective of their time. So I, and I kind of understand that. I kind of understand, I don't know what complicated lives people have. Some writers, uh, you know, have families, uh, they have uh, to take care of somebody, they have to work very hard, and I get it. They don't have time to do certain things. I was very lucky. You know, to this day, I, you know, one of the, one of the, the jokes I say, uh, I say, how can you do all, all that you can do? I said, well, I have no peas. I said, what do you mean no peas? Yeah, I have no parents, I have no progeny, I have no pets, no plants, uh, and that's why I can do all these things. I have none of those things. Uh, so taking, you know, understanding that I did have the time, and also is there really time? There's never time. It's just like when my brother told me, when, when uh, he and his wife were trying to figure out if they're gonna have a baby. I said, well, are you gonna, what's, what's stopping you? So I said, well, I don't know if we, if we can afford it. I said, I said, Alex, nobody can afford children. <laughs> Just have children. All right, if you're gonna wait till you can afford it, you're gonna wait a very long time. And I say the same thing to writers. You know, oh, I don't have time. If you're gonna wait for a time, you're never gonna have it. So don't wait. You make time. Right. So during this time, Post and Writers Magazine asked me, would I go out there and, and write these profiles of writers? Right. Uh, and so this, and so I know that I was not the first one asked, just like I was not the first one to be asked to write those reviews for the El Paso Times. It's just, I'm the one that said yes. I'm the one that said, sure, you know, I'll give up my time to do this uh, because it's important, it's for the community. And so here are a few of, the, few of the writers that I profiled over the years. Many of these are, uh, are place-based, meaning that I, I go to wherever they live, uh, which sometimes not that exciting. Uh, I think the only exciting one was when I interviewed the author, Raji Muhabir, who happened to be in Hawaii, well, that was fun. So I spent nine days in Waikiki uh, and, and talking to him and interviewing him, and that was fun. Uh, others, you know, not, not, not so interesting the places, but the people, always very interesting. And again, I'm still doing that. I just did the last one a couple of weeks ago. I went to Denver, Colorado, to speak to, to the writer, uh, Kali Fajardo Einstein. And um, uh, at this point, I just do it for fun, because I like it. I know I can do it. You know, that's another thing uh, that sometimes writers, say, no, I, I don't know if I can do it. You know, and, and this, this doubt is, for me, is very fascinating. And I know that many of you will come across this, well, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can. I thought, well, again, this attitude is also something that I took from my family. It's like, that's never the question, is whether or not you can, right? It's just, are you gonna do it, yes or no? Do it, and the answer has to be yes. It sounds easy, I know. But I think it's, it's, it's better to understand if you can do it is because you actually tried it, not because you imagined that you may or may not be able to do it. Right? You actually tried it. So in 2006, these, uh, these two books, and these two books, 
came out at the same time, and this is when I'm really, uh, and I've always been open about my sexuality as a gay man, and I was gonna put it all into these two books. And Butterfly Boy is also my other bread and butter. This is a book that's continually taught at universities across the country. And I know it's because I received a big fat royalty check every summer from Butterfly Boy. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's a book that I knew the story was not unusual. I knew the story was not unique, but I also knew the story was not written down. Uh, and it's really, it's a, it's a coming to America, coming into language, coming into education, and also coming out story. When I published the book, uh, you know, I was also lucky that this, this amazing thing also happened in, in the world, and that was the internet and email. So that was new. And so people could actually uh, reach me and tell me that they've read the book, they've um, liked the book, very few people complained about the book, and that was nice. But mostly there were, what I kept hearing was, oh, you know, that's, that's my brother's story. That's my cousin's story. That's my uncle's story. That's my friend's story. Or that's my story. For the first about year and a half of the life of this book, almost every week I received such an email. And it made me feel much less lonely and isolated in the world. Right? And I knew that I would, that I would find these, these folks. Uh, that they would find me. And I think that's another thing about, about being a, a writer in the world. It's, it's a very, uh, it can be a very lonely, solitary, you know, act. Uh, nobody is there with you. It's not a community effort to sit down and write. You're, by, you're in front of the computer, you're by yourself, and you just gotta do it. Um, but then when the book is out, and then it finds its community, it finds its readers, people who engage with it, people who see something there of value, uh, people want to talk to you about it. People want to see themselves on, on, the, on pages of the book. Right? Uh, it was important for me to, to write as many books as I could because as I was moving through the education system, the bookshelf for writers like me was, was very slim, very few. Uh, so many of these books were not available in the libraries. Like I said earlier, so many books were small press, so they never found their way into the libraries or the bookstores. Uh, you have to be very active and very persistent about searching for these books, right? And so I, I got to see this library grow with my books and then other writers along with it. And then the other book is a book of poems, Other Fugitives and Other Strangers. And this, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see it. Uh, you know, the photograph that the, the publisher showed me, I thought, okay, that's kind of cool. And then later people started seeing all kinds of weird things on the cover. Uh, I, I know it's a little bit, it, it's erotic, but people just came up with like this wildest speculations about what was actually on the cover. And it's just a mirror image, but you know, you can see. I'm, now that I put it in your head, I know you can see what you can see up on the, on the cover, but that's not intentional. It's not some weird, you know, images that we're putting out there. It's just the, what people kept seeing on the cover. So the National Book Critics Circle was my other big opportunity. Uh, and this was an opportunity to be part of one of the three sort of largest uh, uh, award granting institutions, the other being the Peel Prize and the National Book Awards. Right? So this is the National Book Critics Circle. Uh, and just incidentally, eventually I was actually a jury, a juror for the Peel Prize and also for the National Book Awards, as much later. Uh, so during this time, uh, working for the National Book Critics Circle, uh, here I was like the baby, uh, uh, the baby critic because the other critics in the room were very seasoned uh, uh, book reviewers from the LA Times, from the New York Times, and you know, I was from the El Paso Times, you know, the smaller newspaper. Uh, and, then, and I wasn't from El Paso, and, but people in El Paso know me and they think that I'm from there because they read my work for, for over a decade. Uh, but it just happened that somebody uh, somebody knew somebody else and they were looking for, for just somebody that could review books. And, and again, that's how I, I just raised my hand and I said I would do it. Um, but the National Book Critics Circle would be an opportunity to sit at the table and try to award, uh, uh, redirect the conversation towards books that I felt deserved attention. And you know, one thing that I learned is when we have institutions that we, we protest and we, we want to change and we shake our fists from the outside, that's one way to do it. And that's 
the way that my family did it for many years as migrant farm workers, because they didn't have a seat at the table. So one way that they could do the protests is to actually strike, right? To strike and to uh, shake their fists up in the air. That's one way. But the other way that I, that I figured out was to actually be at the table myself without having to, to you know, necessarily sell out. Although I'll be honest, and you know, I get those accusations all the time. Because thinking, well, how can you be, you know, you're supposed to be outside. You're supposed to be, you know, shaking your fist from the outside, not be inside. I said, well, this is one way that I learned that I could change things from the inside. So redirecting the conversations, bringing up books that perhaps might not have been discussed had it not been at the table. Uh, and during that time, I also took advantage of their, of their then blog, and I did 61 interviews uh, a small press writer, so it was a, it's called the Small Press Spotlight. But I also had to work uh, at an organization. That's one thing that I, and I knew that, that if I worked hard enough, another thing that my family taught me, if you're the hardest working person in the room, th nobody will ever want to see you leave. And so this, uh, being at, the, at, at the, uh, uh, the National Book Creek Circle, the terms were four year terms, and I served eight. Because for six years I was a treasurer and I was the only one that could do their books. And then after that, for two years, I was the awards coordinator. Everything from like ordering the wine to like really dumb stuff like that. However, I still had a place at the table. Um, is that, I, I, were there people that didn't have to do any of that? Absolutely, the book you're from the LA Times and New York Times didn't have to do any of that. And they always had a place at the table. But I understand, I understood that for me, it was gonna be a little more difficult. But you know what, I was willing to do the work and that's what it took. Again, labor is not something to be embarrassed or ashamed about, it's something to be celebrated. You work hard. And that work ethic is something that has kept me going. In 2008, this is a, a, my only sort of book of stories. How many here write stories? Short, any, any story writers? Nobody? Okay, the faculty. Thank you faculty for that. <laughs> But you read stories, right? I always found the short story to be the most difficult, the most difficult form. Uh, so I only wrote one book and I'm never gonna write another story again. Uh, that was it, and even then, this, I'm, I wasn't as, that happy with this book, but it was my story collection. Uh, and it, it's uh, um, called Men Without Bliss with a, quite a, a provocative cover there. Um, this is one of the books that, you know, some books are very successful, others just kind of fall flat on their faces and nobody talks about them. And this was one of them that kind of disappeared until like recently, like some uh, doctoral student in Spain contacted me to say that he was writing his dissertation on this book. I was like, wow, first of all, where'd you find it? Because I can't get a copy of it. But uh, you know, he found a copy, he loved it, and he's gonna be interviewing me to, for his dissertation. So you never know, you never know who's gonna be your reader. And this many years later. This 2008. So another thing that I, that I saw that, uh, that there was a, a lack of, it's changed now. Now there's so many young people writing, the Latino writers, Latinx writers, writing young, for the young adult market. And I, was, and I remember publishers telling me, you know, there's such a need. Have you ever tried writing young adult? And I wasn't really that interested uh, in writing uh, young adult. Uh, I, knew, I was very familiar with young adult novels. I love reading them. But to actually write them to him, I said, why don't I, do I have a story? It's, do I really want to go there? And, um, and also, I don't know how many of you hated high school, but I hated high school. Why would I want to go back? Why would I want to go back to that place that I just I detested, you know? Uh, but during this time also, a couple of the number of tragedies that were happening in, in, the, in, in, in the United States, including um, you know, uh, the, the, hard, the very difficult reality that um, LGBT youth are more likely to commit suicide than other groups uh, their age. Um, so then I thought, you know, maybe I can, I can try it, you know. And so I did a, I did actually, I wrote three. And this is the Mariposa, Mariposa Club series. Uh, the Mariposa Club, the Mariposa Gown, and Mariposa You. And uh, the first two were very popular with the young crowd. Um, and the third one, uh, they all hated it. Because in the third one, I split the group. There was four young gay men who were trying to understand themselves as high school seniors, trying to understand their, their place in the world and what was gonna happen once they left this nest of high school, right? And so in, 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 the, in the fourth book, I, you know, they couldn't all go to the same college. So I said, I followed only one. 
And then the other thing that the young readers, because there's actually a whole network of young adult readers, and they're young people, and they're very vocal about the books that they read. And so they kept asking me, you know, why don't these young people have sex? And I said, well, I don't know, it's like I, it may feel weird as an adult male trying to imagine, you know, this. I said, well, I, I, you know, their lives are, are very complex. You know, they can, there's other ways. I mean, not they don't think about it, but why should I have to show it? Uh, so finally in the book three, I did so and they hated it. They thought it was the most unconvincing uh, sex they'd ever read. Um, and the other reason I, I finally wrote it because the kid turned 18, so I feel a more comfortable writing that. But, you know, so that was like, that was like my failure. Oh, they never forgave me, the Mariposa you. Uh, that was tough. So this is my, the, a new role that I undertook was as editor. Uh, and this was putting together anthologies. Another thing, you know, that, that uh, uh, there had been an, a, a series of anthologies from the 70s, 80s uh, with Latino writers, uh, but nothing very contemporary, nothing updated. So uh, Camino del Sol is a, is a literary series at the University of Arizona Press, and they were celebrating uh, their 15th, 15th year, and they wanted to do an anthology of all this contemporary work that I had published, and they asked me to do the selections, and it was a lot of fun to do it. I eventually, I took another role with the, with the press, and I'll, I'll discuss that in, in a minute. Uh, but again, this is an opportunity to, to, again, get to know the literature a little better. Uh, it's, it was important for me as a critic, as a teacher, uh, and also just to understand, you know, what, 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 what are there any trends? Or are there any where, where are, are the is, are the imagination of Latino writers going during this during this time? Uh, and it was quite fascinating to to uh, to understand the field in that way. The collection Black Blossoms, um, and this is all. This is a, a if my first book was a love letter to Mexico. If the second book was all about men, then I wrote a book that was all about women. And that's what, that's what this, this was, Black Blossoms. Uh, my poems are, are not very, they're very dark. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, and I put all the darkness on the page. I don't think that I'm particularly dark in that way. Uh, uh, I, I hope that I have a sense of humor. I hope that, you know, some people think I'm funny, but, all the darkness I think I put on the page. Another anthology that I edited for this a veteran writer, Alorista. Uh, he was a writer very important in the 60s and 70s, you know, older gentleman, and, and I was asked, you know, can you do a, a, a selected of Alorista's body of work? And of course, I, I can say anything but yes. I know that opportunity. So 2013, it was a very productive time for me. I'm always working on, on different projects at the same time. It's not like I set out to publish three books in one year. It's just that I work on so many projects at once that it just happened that these three were completed around the same time and all three were published at the same time. So Ready Gretados is a book of essays. Uh, Autobiography from a Hunger is a, is a memoir. And then Unpeopled Eden is a book of poems. Uh, no publisher is going to forgive you if you publish two books of the same genre because they're considered a competition. They compete with each other, right? So this one they weren't because they're all three different genres. You know, during this time, a couple of, of changes were, were happening in my in my personal life. Um, you know, there was a. The, the, my family started dying, basically. Uh, I started losing, you know, I lost my mother and my father when I was very young. Uh, eventually I lost, I lost my grandparents and my uncles. So people were, were, dis, were disappearing uh, from, from my life and from the world. Uh, so, so during this time I had to, my imagination sort of shifted a little bit in terms of uh, if, if, I would, if, I, if I was writing to mirror the community, uh, suddenly I've had this impulse to write in order to preserve, in order to remember. Uh, it was important for me to remember because one of the, you know, many of you have such a privilege to have the technology that you do. You can take a picture, you know, even now, at this moment, right? Uh, technology was not always available. 
So when my parents passed away, you know, I, I wasn't given anything. There were no photographs. There was no, and I just have a, I think only one photograph of my mother. I have my father's, uh, he had a, he was very pleased to be a boxer when he was very young and he kept his uh, membership card. And that's the only thing that my brother and I have of my father. The only thing, we have nothing else. Uh, and my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, we also have nothing of them at all. Uh, except for a couple of photographs I'm gonna show you. I only have three photographs of my grandmother and I'm gonna show you two of them. The third one is just for me. Uh, and so how then could I honor these lives? How could I make sure that other people remembered them, other people uh, talked about them? And that was by, by writing about them. Right. So this is like a, a fun little chapbook that I did. And this one, uh, the reason that, it, that it's, uh, uh, it's up here is uh, because this, this painting uh, caused such a stir uh, in Mexico City. It was in a museum and there was like a riot. They all wanted to go in there because everybody, this is the, uh, a, a erotic representation of one of the Mexico's national heroes, Emiliano Zapata, during the uh, Mexican Revolution. And so everybody was so offended by this image that they were, they were like literally battering ram, using a battering ram to get into the, into the museum that had this exhibited. And it just had this, but the, the image was selected by the publisher like the year before. So all of a sudden people wanted this image and this became like a little bestseller because everybody wanted, everybody wanted this image of this, uh, of Emiliano Zapata in this. And the, and the book is, it's a little tiny book called The Lady of the Crossword. So we, we just, I just kind of published it because there were poems that I had lying around and they weren't going to go into the books. And my friend's like, well, they publish in a little tiny little chapbook and it'll be just a little fun thing that we hand out to people. And next thing you know, it's like 20th printing and he's like selling it like, still selling it like hotcakes. Stuff that I did, I'm gonna skip over this because it's not that exciting. I want to talk about the, uh, the Pivotal Voices Era Transition is my collection of, of essays. And, and this one, again, it, it was important for me to, to gather these, all these pieces that were missed, that were all over the place. Some, some of them were available online, others in, only in magazines, others were only in the newspaper. Uh, again, it's an archive, right? Just like I was always, like I'm always thinking about the archive and what is gonna be available, what's gonna be accessible to readers 20, 30, 40 years from now, right? And I thought, well, I'm gonna put all these essays uh, that I've written over the years and collect them in this, in this, in this series. Uh, so Pivotal Voices Era Transition Toward a 21st Century Poetics. And I do write mostly writers of color. I write about um, uh, also writers from the past that are still relevant in the present. It's always been important to me, the, the, the literary lineage of Latino uh, letters. The memoirs, uh, this, this book I, I wrote uh, for my brother. Uh, you know, my brother and I have been, we, we've been on this journey together, uh, you know, both of being orphaned uh, when I was 12 and he was 11. And uh, when I wrote Butterfly Boy, the first book, I remember that uh, I said to my brother, you know, this is about us, but I really didn't write you in it because it's my story and I don't wanna write your story, you have your story, right? And so after he read the book, uh, he said to me, I asked him, what do you think about the book? I said, well, you know, I, I really liked it, except that I wish I was in it a little more, you know, because I don't know, I, why can't I be in your, in your stories, right? And so something happened uh, uh, a couple years before this. Uh, you know, Mexico, I don't know how many of you know about, the, about some of the dangers in Mexico and the, car and the rise of the cartel. My family's from Michoacan, and in Michoacan, is the birthplace of the cartel. I and mean, that's where the, those, the, the cartels took over. Uh, we lost our land that we had uh, because they wanted to grow uh, marijuana and we used to grow corn. So we lost our land to the cartel, like many people did. Uh, and so one of the things that happened uh, with my brother was that he was kidnapped. Uh, because I set up my brother with a little business just a little taco stand. I thought, well, I'll give something to my brother to, to be proud of. Um, and so I set up a little taco stand. And in the communities that are so poor, even the person that just runs a taco stand is, is wealthy, and has money. And so he was basically kidnapped for ransom. And um, I didn't know what to, 
I, I didn't know what I was going to do at the time, uh, but we got through it, you know. That's my hook. You're going to find out what, what happened after you read the book. But, uh, but we got through it. And, and, I, and so I wrote this book in honor of that, of that journey, uh, trying to understand my, my brother's relationship uh, to myself and also to, to this complicated world that he's is still part of in Mexico. So when I traveled to Mexico, when I traveled to my homeland, I was telling my, uh, my friends earlier, is I had to sneak in and out of the town because it's very dangerous for people to know that I'm coming from the, from the north. Because they won't kidnap me, but they'll kidnap somebody who uh, was very dear to me in order for me to pay ransom. So they'll kidnap my grandmother or kidnap my cousin, and they'll make me pay the ransom. So I, I, I took my last trip down to Michoacan in March. That was the last time I'm going to go until Mexico changes or that part of the country changes, just to say goodbye to my grandparents who I lost in the, in the fall. So around this time, another challenge. I was asked, you know, since you write children's books, have you tried writing children's books in Spanish? Uh, and this was for the, the benchmark education company. And so they wanted to use, the, these are our, our textbooks. I don't know if you, if you uh, uh, in first, second grade, there's these very specialized textbooks that are used to, to teach children vocabulary, teach things our children about, you know, um, morality, all, all kinds of lessons. And so they, they enlisted, uh, uh, I think there were five of us, so there were five writers, and we each had to write eight children's books uh, for different grades, like first, second, third, fifth, and so forth. Uh, and so they asked, and so I thought, okay, well, let me, let me try it. And I mean, I really, I mean, I did those two children's books, but they were very specialized, and I kind of knew how to do that. We'll see about this, this, this new challenge. And I did them. And so, you know, I finished them, I sent them in, sent my eight, and they were very shocked because everybody else had only done like two. Uh, so because I was so good and so fast, they said, do 10 more. <laughs> and so I did 18 in total. So I finished what the others couldn't even finish. Right? And so these are only available in Spanish and only available uh, as textbooks. And uh, some of these were, were interesting. The ones that I did not like to write, interesting enough, were the ones in which the characters were animals in a kind of way Disney. I don't know, I just couldn't get into that. I mean, I can just, it wasn't about suspension of disbelief. It was just trying to imagine like, uh, let's see, I think one of them is called the uh, La Hormiguita Sarita. And this was to teach children about science and, uh, and ants and the way that ants uh, collaborate, right? That, that how, they, how they help each other in terms of, of taking back the you know, food to the to the to the ant uh, to the anthill, and so one thing. That, so this is like a little story about this little uh, lazy ant who figured out another way to to carry things, so she didn't have to travel far. And that's when ants, and that's actually uh, uh, scientific that they do. They do like a kind of like a chain, you know. They they move things in, in a chain instead of traveling all the way back and picking one thing. They can meet each other, take it, and meet each other and take it back. Right. So that's what the. So she came up with this idea. And that's what the little story was about. But uh, yeah, and I, I kept telling them, don't give me those stories, man. I just, I don't know, I just don't, can't do the Disney stuff. Um, 2019, another uh, editing opportunity, uh, the magazine Plowshares asked me to edit, even though I never published in the magazine. And then, uh, and the book of Ruin, and this was my, my end of the world book. Uh, this book was also one that kind of fell flat until the pandemic happened, and all of a sudden the book felt like, oh, wait a minute, there's something about your book. And the book is about the, uh, the, 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 the book of ruin is the ruin of the planet. Um, uh, in it, I, I navigate through these moments in history that have been, that have shown us that we are damaging the earth, and that we are hiding the bodies in the ground, uh, all the destruction that we've done to this earth and to each other, and that's what the that's what the book is is touching on. It's it's uh, you know what I've never seen a more glum audience than when I read from this book, <laughs> because I said it's the, the end of the world, and I said and I said this was going to happen in this in the end of the world, and, and there's a big epic poem in there, and I said this was going to happen, you know that the young people are just going to get rid of all the old people. And yeah, so, so I, I, and that's what, that's the, the, the uh, because they're angry that we did this. We did this to the world, the planet that they're gonna inherit, 
and we did this to, to them. So I know there were a couple of passages in there that people connected to the pandemic. I'm like, well, this is like really like prophetic. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just gotta take credit for it. Of course I knew the whole time. Was... So Camila Sol, I took over as series editor. And so far, you know, we've published three books, uh, these three books. And in this one, I, I take a very, uh, um, a very direct, uh, I'm very directly involved with the editing of the books. It's not just like you, I get the manuscript and I publish it. It's like I work with the author to make the to improve the manuscript. So I've done, we've done three so far, and then we have three more forthcoming. So it's been a, it's been a lot of fun to to work on the on this series. So now comes the editing moment. So the my my latest book came from, you know, remember that that older lady with a purple bandana. So this is where my grandparents are buried. Uh, and you'll notice that my, it's my grandfather's image is on, on there, but my grandmother's is not. Uh, they're buried in, uh, in Coachella, California, which is a place where they, they worked as farm workers most of their lives. And I always knew that my grandmother, uh, I knew that's not where she wanted to end up. And I also knew that my grandmother did not like my grandfather. They had a very difficult marriage. They had a very troubled marriage. Uh, and so I always thought there was some kind of bizarre um, choice to bury them together because I don't think that they belong together. Uh, so this, looking at this, at this um, slab of stone over their graves is what got me going on a search to write the next book about my grandmother. I knew very little about her. I knew my grandmother was a Purepecha, indigenous woman. I knew that she spoke with Ipecha, which was an indigenous language. And when I was young, she had tried to teach some words to my brother and I in the mornings. And you know, when you're a kid, that's the last thing you want to do is learn the language. Uh, so I've, but uh, my grandmother was, was um, did not, um, she was very unconventional. She did not know how to cook. She didn't want to clean. She worked. And she never wore her, sh and she always wore her hair like this, very, very short. That was my grandmother, Maria Carrillo. Uh, and so the book was my way of trying to understand who this complicated woman was. And that's why the book is called Abuela in Shadow, Abuela in Light, because I'm not sure that I learned any, anything more, but I did appreciate uh, the woman that she was. Uh, for a woman who had to learn Spanish, because she, she spoke uh, uh, Purepecha, who moved to the United States in the 60s, who uh, stayed in the US even after my grandfather died. We thought, oh, for sure she's gonna go back home, and, and she didn't. What she did, she actually moved to a, a little house on the border. She closed it off so none of us were even allowed to go and, and, and talk to her. She, we could talk to her through the fence. And then eventually she had a woman move in with her. Right? And that was another kind of interesting discovery about my grandmother, you know, later in life. Um, and my grandmother, she was a, she, she was a, she knew how to have a good time. And here she is getting down <laughs> with my, with my great grandmother. They're, they're dancing. One of the rare photographs that I have of her uh, in, in a moment of joy. Uh, because that's the other thing I remember of my grandmother. There was so much sadness. And so I didn't want to write a book in which I froze my grandmother in this sadness or in this darkness because I knew that was disingenuous and that was not true. People have complicated lives. It's just that we don't know what those other parts of their lives are. So the book was imagining what that was and finding clues to what was it that gave her beauty, gave her joy. Whether it was dancing out in the desert in her sandals, uh, drinking a beer like she do, uh, playing soccer. My grandmother was so good at soccer, I remember when I was little, that, uh, you know, and I was not a, a good sports guy. And so one time I remember my grandmother was just watching my friends and I play soccer. And at one point we needed a goalie. And I don't know why my friend said, well, that's your grandmother. I'm like, wait, my grandmother? And my grandmother did, and she was such a better soccer player that whenever <laughs> my friends came around, they're like, is your grandmother coming to come on and play? <laughs> she also loved boxing. So my grandmother was a very masculine in that sense. Uh, and so the book is not necessarily, you know, a, a, a kind of outing of my grandmother. It's just trying to understand the complexity because sometimes those labels 
are not are not uh, enough. Uh, the, it's it's so mythology is so interesting, right? But the reality is is uh, even more interesting and more complex. So that's what this book, Abuela in Shadow, Abuela in Light, uh, is is about. So I'm trying to figure out. So this is the trajectory of me again, again trying to trying to remember, trying to write it all down. I'm hoping that my niece and nephew will be interested in it. If not, somebody else's niece and nephew will be interested in it. To understand that they were complicated people, that they were complex people, uh, in you know moving around in this space, uh, they might be similar to their grandparents or their uncles and aunts or their cousins or their brothers, right? That they that and, and therefore just like when I first had Butterfly Boy and the community was built through my readers, that they understand. Oh look, there's somebody who resembles somebody that I know. Therefore, again, the, the world is much less lonely that way. So just a, a, couple of, a, a couple of things. These are my forthcoming projects. In 223, I have my newest selected uh, coming out, and that's a selection of the five books plus new material. And also, I'm currently undertaking uh, another anthology, which is the 500 Years of Latino Poetry for the Library of America, going back to like the late 1400s. Yes, there was poetry here in Spanish in this country. Um, and then this is the, 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 the next image. And, I, and I, this takes me back to the earlier image that you saw earlier of me as a little boy. I saw this image of these little brown kids. And this is March 12th, 1928, the St. Francis Dam, 50 miles north of LA. The St. Francis Dam was part of a big project that was designed to bring water to this burgeoning city called Los Angeles. There was only about 100,000 people living in LA at the time, and it was mostly a rural community. So they needed the water to, for all the farmland that was there. Um, the dam, because of the lack of the technology at the time, the dam was built on top of a, a landslide site. So now there's, there's actually technology that helps you determine whether or not you can build a dam on top of a certain, but that wasn't available at the time. So the dam was built. And so when the dam was built, once the water accumulated and then the pressure and then the move the move the, the dam, it broke. And it, of course, when the when the dam breaks, the water goes up all the way back to sea. So it took everything along with it that's on its path, including a migrant farm working community. And so these were the uh, orphans at the refugee uh, at the at the uh, survival survival camp that was uh, set up the relief camp that was set up uh, by, the, by the Red Cross. And so I'm haunted by this photograph, and I thought of myself, again, at the, at the farm worker uh, photograph that you saw, the very first one. And so I see a connection here, and I'm trying to understand, uh, and I don't necessarily, I'm not gonna write the stories of these children, but I'm gonna write the story of that loss. And that's what I'm interested in. Right? So I think I talked for about an hour. I know that's a lot, I know that. But are there any questions? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. How were you able to know your path and like where you wanted to go with being a writer mm -hmm. coming from a community of illegal migrant workers mm -hmm. who mentioned a lot of your family was illiterate? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. You know, uh, I always tell this. I always tell this. Uh, this story. I say, you know, how long do you think it took me to learn English? How long do you think it? Because you know, we cross the border. I was born in Bakersfield. I was two years old, and my family goes back to Mexico, and then we come back when I'm ten years old. So I don't know any English. So my family had this expectation that I had to learn. How long do you think I had to learn so that I could help my family? How long? If you were being, you're 10 years old, how long do you have? Any, any guess? No? You know how much? Five minutes. <laughs> and I'll tell you how. When we crossed the border, my grandfather pulled over to the hot dog stand and said, go get us a hot dog. So there I go. And thinking, I don't know why I thought the guy would know Spanish, and he didn't know Spanish, so I came back to my grandfather, you know, 
he doesn't speak Spanish. I says, no, it's not that he does, you don't speak English. I says, look at this. If you don't speak, you can't even get a hot dog. Now, can you, it, just by that, even you can't even get a hot dog. So what else are you gonna, everything else is gonna be denied to you, right? So I knew right away that I had to learn this language, right? And so learning this became my superpower. Now, the one thing is that I always love to read. And so immediately, I mean, I, when you're 10 years old and you are curious about the world and you are curious about and want to have these things more than just a hot dog, I mean, more than that. So I had to learn all this right away. So I was like a sponge, right? So that became my superpower. And I learned it was a superpower because, you know, at the time, spam, you know the spam that you get on email? Back in the days, you got it in the actual mail with a stamp on it, right? And so whenever we got that, that, this, this, that, those flyers in the mail and it had the, the eagle stamp on it, my grandmother would be terrified. She thought, oh my God, it's the government. They're gonna throw us out. They're here for us. They found us, right? And, and I would open it up and it went, no, it's advertising a, a furniture sale somewhere. And I thought to myself, you know, this again, this is what not knowing the language can do, right? So, you have to, so I had to overcome that, right? And I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm not gonna be afraid and I'm not gonna have these other you know, elements sort of dictate how I wake up in the morning, how I feel about myself. I have to take control, I take ownership of it. So I became a, a voracious reader. I learned English rather quickly. You know, I, it, just, it felt like it was five minutes because all of a sudden I had to navigate through the, all these spaces and um, and the journey from being a, a, a writer to being a reader, I'm gonna show it to you right now, okay? Here's me as a reader, okay? Now I'm gonna be a writer. Dude, it's so small. If you're a reader, you're gonna, you can be a writer, right? It's such a tiny, tiny leap. So all of a sudden, you know, me sitting down and writing a story, I said, of course I can do it because I've read so many. I've read so much, right? Same thing with all these other, like, all these other challenges that I, I talked about, from the children's books to the young adult novels to the book reviews. I have been reading all that. It's not like I all of a sudden I had to go do research and understand. I've been reading that all along, right? So just to get in there, and just, there's a fearlessness to it, a fearlessness that has to ha happen, and trust that you are intelligent enough to do that. And, and this confidence has to come from you. Because one thing I learned, if you wait, for everybody, anybody to give you permission, you're not gonna get it. The only permission you need is from yourself. Same thing with doubt. If everybody doubts you, you can still write, but if you doubt yourself, you won't be able to. Right? So all these different ways in which I learned to fortify a confidence in myself. Right? And, there, and, and it almost felt like there was no other choice for me you know, because literacy was important. So that's why books are important. And you know, I, I don't believe in any book banning. Uh, uh, I don't believe in telling people not to read something. So many of the reviews that I wrote are actually positive book reviews. Right? So I thought, well, how lame is that? Tell people, don't read this book. People are not gonna read the book anyway. I'd rather encourage people to read a book. Right? Other questions? Yes? Um, how does cost you Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't think that I'd be able to write it if I if I hadn't come out to myself, right? I mean, and I understand people sometimes for whatever for whatever reasons, um, and I could only do that because I left my family. You know, when I was living with my family as a teenager. You know, I actually sat down and I thought to myself, you know, what, how, what is it that, I, that, that will kill me if I stay with this family? I can deal with the poverty. I can deal with the illiteracy. I can deal with not having things. But I don't think I could stand if my family were to disown me, if they didn't like this about me. I don't think I could handle it. So I left the family in order to feel safe. So that if, if they ever did disown me, I was already in my own I had my own path, my own life, right? So when I, when I decided to, to, to write about these things, well, I knew my family was not gonna read it, they couldn't read, 
right? So there was a safety there, right? They weren't going to read anything. But, but there was actually a, a, a moment when I wrote my, the other fears and other strangers because it was about, um, it was about the abuse that sometimes gay men inflict on each other. And I remember when I, when I first published that book, uh, even other gay writers were a, little, were a little hesitant. They're like, you know, we're trying, because the book, it, it was published in, um, let me remind myself, when was that book published? Okay, 2006. 2006, right? And I remember somebody just very directly said to me, you know, we're trying to change the perception of gay lives in this country, and now you're gonna tell them that we're violent. I don't think that's a good idea, right? And I stuck to my guns because I said, you know, we can't just romanticize. We can't lie. You know, we can't pretend. We gotta be honest. I think that's the only way they will be seen as human is they were seen as complicated, as complex, not romanticized. Uh, so I received a lot of criticism for that book, but it was probably the same year as Butterfly Boy, and Butterfly Boy received all the praise, so that kind of evened things out. Um, so in, in, in that book too, I was very, on, uh, very open and honest about abusive relationships, you know. Um, and I thought, if I'm gonna be a writer, you know, a, a professor of mine once told me, he said, you know, writers are actually the bravest, some of the bravest people in the world because they'll put their name on it. You can't deny it, that's it, you put your name on it. Are you gonna say, oh, that was me? Oh, that's another Rigoberto González. <laughs> you know, no, that's me, right? And so I said, you, you just have to be honest, right? Uh, and eventually, you know, the, 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 the LGBT community caught up you know, with what I was always saying, that we are fallible, we are flawed, we are not perfect. And to try to pretend that we are is just disingenuous, and I think they are unhealthy. Because then what happens to those people that cannot be that, idealized versions? What happens to them? Thank you. Uh, one more question. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do write, I do inhabit the persona, you know, when I write poetry. It's like, uh, the only time I write myself is really through, through the memoir, right? Uh, even though, like, the, for example, the book I wrote by my, by my brother, it's through my point of view. It's never through his point of view, right? Uh, there was one little chapter in which I do imagine myself in my father's shoes, and it was a very experimental chapter. Uh, but again, it doesn't erase, uh, I don't mean to erase or to, to um, uh, to cancel like his narrative. I, I, again, it's like one thing I realized that I don't know so much, so I have to imagine it. Just like those photographs, I don't have photographs, so I have to imagine those photographs, right? So when I rob my family, I try to do the same thing. But I try to, you know, I try to do right by them by representing them as, as again, complicated individuals, being honest about who they were, and also, you know, understanding that, that this perspective that I have is incomplete. It's not the, the end of the, it's not the, the complete picture of who they were. Uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not meant to be the de definitive version of who they were, right? And I make that clear in the writing. You know, I always say, I think, I don't remember. Those are important things to admit even in writing memoir, right? Uh, again, don't, don't misrepresent yourself and, and what your memory is. Because uh, memory is a very, a very interesting thing. And I'm, I'm sure you, you can appreciate this when you, re you remember things differently sometimes than your family does, right? Because there's different emotions attached to whatever that event was. Uh, and, and the biggest mistake you can make, and sometimes when I teach uh, nonfiction writing, uh, the young writers would tell me, oh, well, I'm gonna go and, and interview and ask questions. I say, we have to be careful with that. Uh, you know, one thing is asking for facts, asking for dates and things like that. Uh, that's, I think that's fine. But when you're asking for their perspective, uh, that, that's a little bit 
difficult because you're going to see that it might not align with yours. So then you have to make a decision about whether or not is one more true than the other. And you don't want to make that decision. You have to know that there are many versions of the story. And you can only tell yours. Thank you so much.